Um, okay, um, greeting everyone. Um, Salamun alaikum and Tanakoto Katoa to our New Zealand audience. Thank you very much for joining us for this esteemed conversation with Dr. Tahira. Um, it is my pleasure. My name is Nagar Pato, and I am a, a visiting scholar as well as a senior fellow at the Center for the Study of the Middle East in Indiana University. We are delighted to set up this um, conversation and this series of talks, which are emerging Women Scholars Talk. Uh, it is a cooperative project between the Center for the Study of the Middle East in Indiana University and the Middle East and Islamic Studies Association in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, which is hosted by Otago. Today, we have our first presenter, Dr. Tasmia Tahira. Dr. Tasmia attained her doctoral degree from the Center for Defense and Security Studies at Massey University of New Zealand in 2023. During her time as a PhD candidate at Massey, Tasmia worked very closely with the national research network called uh, the Middle East and Islamic Studies of Aotearoa, uh, which is hosted in the University of Otago and by Dr. Leon Goldsmith. Dr. Tahira's research addresses the intricate construct of political legitimacy in Pakistan's military following the 2008 democratization process. Her insights in her dissertations have been highly praised by her examiners. Dr. Tahira is now employed by Pakistan's Higher Education Department, where she is a lecturer in political science. As at present, she's also publishing a book chapter with the Center for the Study of the Middle East in Indiana University. Without further ado, thank you very much, uh, Tasmia, for joining us today. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nagar, for inviting me. I want to tell you that today is a very special day in Pakistan. We are having general election. And 8 February was very, um, like we were waiting <clears throat> since last year. And uh, polls are closed and we are just waiting for results. <laughs> Everybody outside is watching TV and um Elections, you know, are, are very important to my research because this is fourth general election after democratic transition of 2008 and military continues to to be still the kingmaker and it's still, its shadow looms large. <laughs> I think the, it, it looms large even much than the last elections. So, um, I will first share the screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I was talking about the election. So my research um, period is definitely from 2008 when first general elections were held uh, after democratic transition. And I closed my period till 2022 when Pakistan has completed almost four tenures of um, transition of powers. So the research problem is that military continues to be very powerful institution in Pakistan and no prime minister has ever completed the their tenure and each prime minister when develop its conflict with the military, its government is deposed and they are not allowed to complete their terms. And every prime minister complains that they when come into power, they just hold the office, not the power. 
particularly, especially Benzid Bhutto, when she came into power, she also complained that she just had an office and she did not enjoy the power or, or any authority to do something. And similarly, when Imran Khan came into power, he also complained that he just had the office and had no authority to do anything or to do to make any changes. So my aim is to uh, explore, my aim was to explore actually that how military, even after democratic transition has upheld this uh, legitimacy, this political power with legitimacy and how it pursue public that its preeminent position in Pakistan society and politics is very important even in the democratic setup. So this problem is usually studied in civil military relations studies and civil military relations studies rest upon the normative assumption that civilians are the political masters of the country's uh, strategic decision making and they should be a complete uh, they should have the complete control over the military and um, in civil military relation uh, studies there's a normative assumption which is definitely which was proposed by Huntington and which has been very uh, famous that uh, maintaining functional differences between civilian and military can mm -hmm. increase mm -hmm. military professionalism and can also enable civilian control but this could not happen or this could not actually materialize in third world or we can say developing countries. And they always face this problem, this enigma to establish civilian control. So a large scholarship developed over uh, over this problem in coup prone countries. Coup prone countries are those countries which experiences military coup or military regimes or military power in some, in any kind or in any form. So um, many scholars argue or assume that military becomes very powerful in these countries because political institutions are weak and they are not in a situation to establish control and they actually create vacuum which allows military to come and to interfere in politics or actually make a coup. And in after post cold war era when us was very interested in fostering democracies abroad it um, put a lot of investment and energy in institutionalization of civilian maintain establishing civilian control in third world countries particularly in latin america in pakistan in egypt but it failed because military resisted um, adaptation with democratic changes. Yes, they um, they were um, successful in holding some kind of general elections and some kind of democratic facade, but not a true uh, democracy. So this problem continues to be studied in civil military relation studies and a new um, a new uh, um, a new group of scholars which uh, usually which is led by Rosen and Skiff, they proposed that actually uh, this problem could be solved in these countries by bringing military and civilian in collaboration and they can work together and we should forget about maintaining, establishing civilian control because this um, <clears throat> this uh, this assumption actually create problem in these countries. But actually, they fail to see that if military is uh, and civilian are allowed to work together and their um, the, their functional differences are eliminated, then military will be more powerful in these countries, and like they will not be able to obstruct or hamper military intrusion like the developed countries because of weak institutions or weak institutional uh, mechanisms. So Pakistan is a very interesting case in all this civil military relations literature because it has a history of military coup and military regimes and military has a very strong position in the country. So many scholars have actually tried to explain military uh, politicization in Pakistan. Some explains uh, who are very, very much influenced by Huntington and realist theories, realist and institutionalist perspective. They say that Pakistani military is powerful and because civilian institutions are weak and they allow the military to become 
um, to become more a dominant institution. And civilian political institution are weak because they are non-participatory, they are dominated by landed elite, who represents the interests uh, interest of the um, elite or uh, industrialist and not the interests of the common man. But um, this uh, claim is um, being now challenged by new scholars like Aisha Sadiqa and Asim Sajad Akhtar. They say uh, that military is also a new landed elite in Pakistan and they hold 12% of Pakistan land and they have um, uh, like uh, past military regimes of Sia, Ayub and General Musharraf actually distributed thousands of acres of land to the military officers and in addition to that, military also have presence in billions of dollars of economy and they have a lot of um, shares in uh, profit making corporations and um, have joint ventures with businesses. So even then they enjoy the trust and consent of the public. So this cannot be a reason that inefficiency of politician or corruption of the politician is allowing the military to come into power. There is another strand which assumes that military's corporate and institutional interest actually politicize the military. And military has uh, this image that military officers are more educated, they are better trained, they are more professional. And um, as compared to politicians, and politicians are ill-equipped to understand the country's strategic uh, problem and geopolitical situations. So this belief is very much infused and has become a part of military's corporate and culture. That's why military confidently um, actually consider its duty to interfere in Pakistan politics and it successfully interferes. So there's a third strand which suggests that Pakistan's historical hostility with India has allowed military to be um, so dominant institution in Pakistan because Pakistan state's top priority has been to have a parity with India. And this has um, impelled the state to allocate mm -hmm. large defense mm -hmm. budget over the years and allowing military to become a central um, authority in decision making in national and international politics, especially in national and defense policy. So the fourth stand uh, assumes that U.S. support to Pakistan for years or for decades have been uh, politicizing Pakistan military because U.S. has sidelined Pakistani politicians over important strategic decision make, uh, decisions and they have directly tried to interact and communicate with generals and with military officers which actually undermined uh, civilian politicians' authority and their image, and it emboldens generals, um, uh, generals, uh, generals to interfere in politics. However, these all scholars have looked at this problem from a very same institutionalist and realist perspective, and none of the scholars has ever used constructivism or any different perspective to look at this problem. So I. Um, um, framed my research question on this gap, which was how has the Pakistan military constructed its political legitimacy in the public discourse following the democratic transition in 2008. Um, I used constructivism because constructivism allowed me to demystify the process, which uh, to do to demystify the process which helps the military to construct its political legitimacy and to interfere in politics with impunity. So I use constructivism in connection with securitization and militarization because military is a security institution and it relies on the security language. It um, infuses military ideals in the society. So these both theories helps me to understand military security practices and their, um, their immense power to undoing uh, legitimacy to military. Securitization explains that how a normal political problem is transformed into a security problem. 
and how this whole transformation problem actually um, gives power to a security agent and it establish a hierarchy and hierarchical power relation in which the security agent claim a position of being a protector, being a guardian. And, and it actually, this position allows the security agent to justify any uh, action, even like surveillance, suppression of civic liberties, and sometimes enforced disappearances, abductions, anything on the name of security. So I started, I use these both concepts with political legitimacy and I use political legitimacy from green perspective, who uh, says that legitimacy in developing countries, political legitimacy in developing countries is not given in any absolute sense, but rather it is constructed when ideas about what is morally legitimate are internalized by given subjects because constitutional frameworks usually become fiction and not useful in these uh, countries. So constructivists have used many methodologies to trace the construction um, of political reality. They have used process tracing, genealogy, participant observation, and many more. But I chose discourse analysis because discourse analysis allows us to understand that how political reality or political actions are normalized, enabled, and legitimized by certain kind of discourses, ideologies, and discursive and argumentation strategies. So when it came to choosing uh, data, I was quite confused at what should be my data and whether I should choose uh, civilians as subject of my study or military or both, but due to time constraints, I chose military only uh, and military. I um, I avoided to take interviews in my research because I wanted to actually observe and analyze the military, uh, military communication in the public sphere. So I chose military publications on different platforms in media and in academia. And there were three um, platforms which I chose. ISPR, inter, uh, which is known as Inter-Service Public Relations Publications, and National Defense University Journals, and Facebook pages. ISPR is a military media wing, which is actually aimed to uh, which actually um, build military's positive image. And it also uh, monitor international and national uh, media reporting on Pakistan military. And it is sometimes alleged for policing Pakistani media. Although Pakistan government has a separate uh, regulatory authority, media regulatory authority, which is known as PAMRA. But usually it is ISPR which control and regulate or dictate the media and what can be said and what, what cannot be said in the media square. A National Defense University is a research institution and it published research on strategic issues, geopolitics, and they also established connection with national and international academia. They published two journals. One is known as Markla Journal and one is National Defense University Journal. And I chose both journals which were published from 2008 to 2022. And then I chose Facebook. I preferred Facebook over Twitter and YouTube. Although military has presence on all platforms, uh, it has presence on Twitter, it has presence on YouTube, it has presence on Facebook. But I prefer Facebook because uh, Facebook has all kind of stuff. Twitter is somehow formal, YouTube has only videos. But on Facebook, um, they share sometimes text, sometimes videos, sometimes images. So the multimodality of the Facebook was the reason that I chose. So ISPR has, ISPR has different account on the Facebook and have huge followers. Like its page has five million followers. So it was quite useful to collect data. Um, 
so initially if we observe the um in my like initial coding when i analyzed starting and when i started analyzing the data from 2008 to 2013 ispr used to only publish on issues like war against terrorism and it, they used to glorify shahadat and the eulogies of shohada memoirs of founding fathers and pakistan ideology but later on they widened their scope and they started publishing on multiple issues including politics economy foreign affairs military defense policy education terrorism internal security so most of the um, popular themes which were appearing um, again and again but these i have given a here a list with we can see that pakistan the ultimate destiny of the muslims of south asia pakistan a symbol of resilience Sorry. Building the nation, Qaeda Azam and Iqbal and Fatima Jinnah's vision of Pakistan, Pakistan by 2023, balancing power in the region, and the list goes on. I divided all those themes into three different categories uh, given by Green, whom I have mentioned earlier on my theoretical framework chapter. So uh, all themes related to identity, ideology, nation, nationhood, nation building, jinnah, modernity, religiosity were analyzed under the discourse of consent. Themes related to security, national security, threats, and other relevant terms, freedom, instability, extremism, were analyzed under discourse of prison and other themes, especially on inclusiveness, progress, and development, were analyzed under the discourse of beneficence. So the discourse of consent is uh, much larger in the military publication. Uh, and it constructs military identity and Pakistan identity. And um, while constructing Pakistan identity, military conflate its uh, identity and its goals with Pakistan identity. And it expects people to uphold its honor equal to the national honor. And it, this discourse establish actually Pakistan around Jinnah. Pakistan identity around Jannah and it ignores all other um, all other political leaders which came after uh, Jannah. For example, Bhutto, Benazir Bhutto, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, or Nawaz Sharif, Imran Khan, or, or any other figure which has been popular in Pakistan history is ignored in this identity construction process. And the whole identity is constructed around Jannah and Nazriya Pakistan is explained through Jannah's lens. And um, Jannah is highlighted as a moderate Muslim who be in Pakistan to be a moderate Muslim state, not a theocratic state. And this actually, uh, this course allows military to define what is a moderate Muslim and what is extremist Muslim. Extremist Muslim is who is abnormal, who is who has some weird kind of ideas, who is extremist, who want to sabotage peace and who don't know how to live peacefully with others. Whereas the moderate Muslim is tolerant, progressive and want to live a modern life and also some um, kind of conservative life as well. Actually, he should know how to assimilate both lifestyles. And it also allows military to reorient the state relationship with religion because uh, this was, uh, this post-2008 is the time when TTP, the, known as Tariqe Taliban Pakistan was uh, threatening um, and demanding to enforce Sharia. And this discourse, especially around Jannah, allowed the military to refute uh, TTP's claim 
and to delegitimize their demands of enforcing Sharia. They, so the most of the articles uh, suggested Dinah did not want Pakistan to be a very conservative Muslim state. And he never meant to enforce Sharia in Pakistan. He wanted Pakistan to practice modern uh, laws and modern European laws and to uh, create conducive environment where Muslims can can progress their life and just live with liberty and freedom. So this whole uh, identity discourse also otherized India and it established um, India as a monolithic Hindu entity which want to sabotage Pakistan peace and Pakistan's national integrity and uh, but what is interesting in this identity discourse because it's more often also rely on Islamic Pakistan Islamic identity and um, for example it justifies Pakistan's formation Pakistan independence through Islamic tropes but it consistently also claimed that Pakistan should be a moderate Muslim state. So this identity discourse established that military is the supreme authority in Pakistan, which would tell what Pakistan should be as a country and what kind of ideals it should have, its people should have. So uh, the next is the discourse of reason. The discourse of reason actually rationalized military security practices and its usage of cursive authority or cursive power. So this emphasize on the broadening concept of national security. This also actually uh, <coughs> run through with the identity discourse uh, within the war on, war on terror context because war on terror context allowed the military to not only define Pakistan identity but also redefine the Pakistan national security. Earlier, to 2001, earlier to 2001, a direct attack from India was considered a primary threat, and it was conceived Pakistan. Uh, it was conceived that Pakistan top priority should be to establish uh, strategic balance in South Asia and to prevent any attack from India on it, Kashmir or on its eastern border. But here in this discourse, military changes its security definition and it redefined the new non-traditional security threats. This uh, discourse claims that military uh, that military actually want to protect Pakistan's ideological premises alongside its borders because India not only want to um, uh, attack Pakistan uh, border but it also actually want to threaten Pakistan Nazariyati Sarhadeh, which in English we can say ideological premises. It want to pollute youth mind. It want to create uh, distance between military and people. And it might disturb the love and the bond between people and uh, military, Pakistani military. So this whole discourse actually urges the government to uh, enforce or to introduce um, strict uh, strict measures for regulation for regulation of the media, and also mid military interfere justify or legalize military interference in the internal security, in surveillance, in suppression of civic liberties, because Pakistan, according to this discourse, Pakistan um, is a third world, not a third world, but developing country and cannot afford to be here. To be unlimited, um, unlimited freedom or unlimited uh, liberty, and it should have some kind of discipline and in conformity. So, um, but this this whole discourse of reason actually bring military into conflict with the liberals in 2015, 16, 17, 18 in these years particularly, and. And because liberals challenge the military discourse of security and military discourse of civilians and, and media regulations. And they also criticize military um, practice of looking all the problems from India-centric um, lens. So um, in this uh, in this in this discourse, military 
consistently criticize liberals and call them pseudo liberals. It claims Jinnah is the actually true liberal who um, amalgamate how modern and um, conservative life. And these liberals are actually Western inspired liberals and they want to endanger Pakistan ideological premises and they want to threaten Pakistan identity and Pakistani ideals or um, Pakistani people. And even within this discourse, Pakistan's relations with China and Pakistan's relations with the United States are explained. Pakistan relations with US are seen very negatively and United States relations with India are actually seen the reason of this anti-Americanism drive in the military publications. Military sees that U.S. and West has been always uh, favoring India and has always always been silent over Indian uh, repression in Kashmir and Indian uh, atrocities and um, Muslim repression or Modi government or BJP government policies, uh, anti-Muslim policies in India, but they are very much concerned about Pakistan, especially in Balochistan and um, human rights issues in Pakistani uh, regions. So China is very much appreciated in this discourse because China maintains distance from its domestic politics and don't want to impose democracy or any kind of model in Pakistan. I think it has become very long. So... <laughs> Uh, so the this course of reason actually uh, even suggested Pakistan can get uh, progress and prosperity if if it uh, follows Chinese model of um, discipline because and it sees Chinese model from a very post-colonial lens. It sees that China even China has um, progress despite um, uh, despite um not adopting um western model of democracy freedom and liberty and um, us is declining and it will decline so it is better for pakistan to emulate china rather than us so the discourse of beneficence actually um glorify military's uh, contribution in the uh, progress of Pakistani nation. <coughs> they highlighted how military has encouraged women empowerment in Pakistan. They, um, uh, they portray the images of women and the images of women who are participating in military in combat and in UN peacekeeping missions. Their stories, their family life is shared they are they are labeled as sister in arms or the heroes of Pakistan who uh, are uh, fulfilling both um, uh, both duties they are also carrying um, they are also carrying their professional life and their family life together they are good wives good mothers good daughters and good sister in arms and good good Pakistani professionals as well so um before this uh, military um, uh, military discourse on gender was very different women were only shown as a victim of uh, the show uh, a victim or uh, the next of kin of lost soldier like shohada's sister shohada's wife and they were given some um, flowers or some gifts or um, appreciated for sacrificing their sons or their brothers but this new discourse actually um, celebrate the women as a military officer and their participation in combat and for carrying this responsibility of uh, defending Pakistan. Uh, um, this also, the discourse of beneficence also includes the discourse on inclusiveness. This actually celebrates military institution practices of uh, allowing um, Christians and Hindus or uh, all other ethnic uh, or religious communities to be a part of the military institution. This discourse claims that military is an inclusive institution and it allows all um, um, 
um, all sects and religion um, to um, to have an opportunity for upward social mobility and um, they are actually um, uh, they they are actually important important part of Pakistan and they make this country more beautiful. So this whole um, this whole discourse actually try to portray Pakistan's positive image, which and uh, refute Pakistan image, which was usually shown as a as a extremist Muslim country, which is non uh, which is not uh, which does not welcome other uh, my minorities like especially christians and then there's an other discourse on development which cherish military <coughs> contributions in the development for example it suggests that military brings transferable skills in the civilian institutions like discipline professionalism better training and civilian institutions should learn from military other like um Although development practitioners see his military uh, contribution in the development sector very negatively, but this refute this uh, image or this assumption. And they say that military is actually um, participating very positively in the development sector. They're building schools, they're building hospitals, they are uh, bringing modern technology in Pakistan, and they are actually uh, helping Pakistan to... Uh, uh, to have more economic growth and prosperity. So this these whole discourse of the military suggests that ideational structures are very important in civil military relations and military consistently negotiate civil military relations and socially construct spaces for its political legitimacy. Like military's political power is not given out there. It is not independent. It is constructed and consistently military uh, negotiate its space. Its impacts of military's political legitimacy that honor of the military is integrated with imagination of sovereignty and security of the state, questioning of its institutional autonomy and political power is considered tantamount to challenging the state. This has made the military as powerful in Pakistan as its Turkish counterpart in Priyur Dhakantar. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Tasmia. That was uh, great. Thank you. So let's open for questions. Anybody has a question? Yes, Carl, please. Yeah, thank you very much. It was really interesting. Um, I have two that are sort of unrelated um the the first one is probably easier uh, so uh i was taken by <clears throat> the bottom picture of the bottom photo on the of the women in uniform um so the question is uh how many uh, how large of proportion of the military are women and do they have any uh senior positions um, so that's that's the that's probably the easy question. the The second question is um, maybe more theoretical. I've asked this uh, a, a friend of mine is a sinologist, and I've asked him a similar question about China, and I haven't really he didn't he hasn't given me a satisfactory answer. And that is um, if if what you're going to do um, if if when you're building uh state institutions and looking for political legitimacy and you are going to reject western or u.s models of democracy why do you retain the word democracy why can't you why, so that my question to to my friend uh about china is why do they bother to call it a democracy when it it's it doesn't look, China doesn't look like a democracy to me. Now, Pakistan, as you said, they have elections. I mean, there was, you know, there's all these great photos and floating around today in the media of, of people sitting on the floor counting ballots. You know, I mean, that it it may not be a Western model of democracy, there's, but they're at least voting. So I guess the question is something like what what is the what is the force of the term democracy 
if the model is conscientiously not a Western democracy. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yes. So I will, I would like to answer first your second question. Um, uh, because military, I think so in these, um, in these publications only shows its opinion, its officers' opinions, not all population opinion. And rest of Pakistani population is very keen to have democracy in Pakistan. And more and Pakistan have democracy because it is uh, envisaged in its constitution. And most of the constitutions are written by Western uh professional western trained professionals western trained individuals and it is not easy for military to change the constitution because it shakes the whole country it actually you have to start a new story so this constitution was written in 1973 and it was very democratic constitution so military try to maneuver the constitution through amendment try to bring uh, changes which actually um, uh, more uh, concentrate power in uh, in the military hand or in single authority. They object freedom of uh, opinion or freedom or any kind of liberty, but they can't change the constitution. That's why they want to hang out with all these kind of ideas. And secondly, military is very much inspired by United States and by West. I think so these... Um, these ideas for emulating Chinese model are reactionary. When they see that China, US is not giving them much uh, lift, I should say, <laughs> not is actually giving priority to India as compared to them, then they start saying that Chinese models are better. When people like General Musharraf are given um, uh, better opportunities or better status or better uh, protocol in US or in West, then they definitely try to um, romanticize democratic ideals. And Thank my you. first question, and, and yes, your first question was about women. Women uh, started to be uh, recruited in 2006. General Musharraf started this and now every year their posts are advertised and I think so a lot, lot of seats are now being uh, allocated to women and they are being promoted to a general position, to brigadier position and uh, they have not uh, come at still at the top at the decision making uh, like core commander team but eventually they will come because definitely you need a 30 years for 30 years of career. And they have just started to come in 2006. So after 10 years, we will see them in top positions. But we don't have any hope because they carry the same chauvinistic and military ideals. And mm. they will use the same language. That's me. Andy, you have a question. Yes, Sarah. yes thank you so much. This is interesting. <laughs> topic. So um, you talk about how the military being civilized, right? In a sense, something like that. Like I call it the military being civilized um, uh, from the point of view that like they uh, they help like um, what the civic supposed to do, like um, in a building and then like in, in service in the uh, public, 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 um, public care. So do like also military um, official go to the university for having civic education? That's the first question. And then um, second, like the otherwise, how the civilians being um, being militarized? Do they have like this this kind of like a two ways of <laughs> relation between military and civil? And then the second, uh, the, the third question is how um, the military relation with um, civic in terms of its youth, its youth movement, or like um, students in the college, something like that. So how how like it's their, their relationship? <laughs> between the um, military and um, um, university students, for example, because Pakistan also has a, uh, how do you say, like, I don't know, it's very dense populations, right? Or um, like a fourth uh, most populous country actually in the world. I don't know how the statistic uh, in Pakistan, like how much like how, how, how much like the, the youngest um, compare than, compare than the, the older generation. So that's my question. Thank you. 
Thank you. So I think you have asked three different questions. So first I will <laughs> give answer of the last question about the youth and the military relationship. I think so before Imran Khan, the story was different. Youth used to uh, um, copy military officers and military was a very glorious institution. But Imran Khan popularity has uh, changed things in Pakistan, <laughs> especially in universities, because most of the youth is uh, his vote and most of the youth whom he have inspired. So since their relationship, the military relationship with Imran Khan broken and they actually uh, military uh, put crackdown on the supporters of the Imran Khan, which were youth, young boys of university, they are abducted, they are kidnapped, they are missing. And um, so this now relationship is being shaken. So we don't know in the coming future what will happen, but currently this is um, the situation is not good. And your second question was that is military going to universities for civic education? No, military has its uh, separate uh, universities. I think so in every uh, major city, it has two, two at least universities. Those universities are very big. They have huge funding from higher education. And they mostly prioritize um, technology and engineering and medical studies but because they have good results their graduates get really good job in us in europe in australia in america so the military actually portrayed at how look how good military universities are doing and through this comparison education is militarized i should say or because they said look discipline is important because military is more disciplined institution so it will bring discipline in university spaces and that is important for students cross uh, for students better results and students uh, uh, success and you what was your third question i'm sorry i have uh, missed oh, just the other way civilized um uh, civilized military and then militarized civ civilians yeah so like militarized civilians like for, for example, example how, yeah, yes, yes, I understand. Like, yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah. people, uh, because people admire military lifestyle, military fathers, like look how they miss the discipline, uh, their kids, how they maintain discipline at home, how, what kind of life they are having. If we see any uh, good uh, boy, a girl in our class, people used to say that, oh, because he belongs to a military family, that's why he's so civilized. So in this way, uh, I think so. Conformity and discipline is uh, actually a thing which inspires people, and this is the way people are people mind are being militarized. I should say because these are the military ideals, not the civil ideals. Oh, thank you. Actually, I still have one question left. Yeah, That's sure. All good. And have... Hasbir, can you also look at your chat? I I sent the comment to you. Please have a look at your chat. Um, okay, any other questions before I ask mine? Yeah, I still have one question, please, Lars. Right. <laughs> so um, the relationship between military and religious organization or sect or whatever that you, um, Pakistan has. This is general questions. How do, <laughs> do they do yeah. relationship? Yeah. <laughs> so their relationship are very tested. They are not open uh, mm -hmm. in these publications which I observed and which I analyzed military completely distance from religious organizations but they are alleged and accused for having or uh, providing patronage to the religious political parties and religious groups so this is a very tricky question because military uh, openly never accept this relationship thank you thank you Thank you, Hera. That was very good questions. Um, Daya, do you have any question, or should I ask mine? We we are also running out of time. Tasmi, I have a question for you, and my question is about the new election. So, yeah. um, what's the story? Nawal Sharif is the candidate again. Um, Ran Khan cannot stand. Zandari criticized the election for the closing of the internet and all sorts of problems. 
how would you see the politics of Pakistan? Do you think, do, so my two questions. So first question, do you think Nawaz Sharif is the preferred candidate for the military? And my second question is that, do you think it's going to be another military coup in disguise under the under the banner of election? Or do you think that it is genuinely is going to, because the turnout was really low too. Thank you, Sir Onigar. Uh, I think so. Military's definite preferred candidate is the Nawaz Sharif because Nawaz Sharif was the person who appointed this army chief, and this army chief now bring have promised tacitly with Nawaz Sharif that he will bring uh, his daughter uh, as the chief minister of Punjab, like on an important political position. So as this chief of army staff was uh, low on the rank on, on, on the list whom the person was being chosen for the chief of army staff and because he was just a um, bad relationship as, a, as an officer with Imran Khan. Yeah, Imran Khan has um, actually ousted him from intelligence as an intelligence chief, not accepted him. So Nawaz Sharif knew his uh, intention some kind of way and so he chose him as a army chief and this person is a uh, some is is not very liberal but i believe this is very similar to general sia and i think so we are going to again sia regime uh, the relationship with this army chief the relationship between army chief and nawaz sharif would be very similar the relationship sia and nawaz sharif both have and this would go to seven to eight years of extreme repression in pakistan extreme repression and right wing uh emerging and becoming more popular and liberals are being suppressed and i think so he is more repressive than they are and you think it's gonna give more momentum to right-wing religious parties too huh? not right-wing religious party but the right-wing sentiments overall in public in the public yeah because they will definitely support imran and nawaz sharif who is a uh, party not right left but conservative oh carl you have other questions yes well i was just curious about um, i was um, it occurred to me about halfway through your talk that yeah, that I'm we so were disturbing. that we were lucky to have you because of the of the internet disruptions <laughs> so um yeah. ha, what what actually happened uh, all I know is that Western, the Western press is saying that that the authorities cut mobile phone access to prevent uh, prevent organizations uh, prevent organization to disrupt uh, the the voting. It did, did you was yours disrupted? Was your phone? No, no, I am actually living in Lahore and my in, in my locality and, and day there was some, not internet, but the other phone access signals were down, but uh, overall they have been good. I think so they were down in Sin, the other province. And what do you think was the purpose of that, if it was done intentionally? Yeah, it could be down if the results are done out or people who are coming to cast vote they are taking name of Imran Khan or they want to give um, they want to bring result different which military has expected then it could definitely be down <laughs> because it could disrupt communication between different district between different presiding officer who are monitoring this um election from my own family from my own home my brother and my sister-in-law today have a duty in district lahore and they are presiding officers on on polling stations and my sister um is uh, on a very very senior position and she told me that they are give they are uh, told that mariam nawaz must win in her, his constituency whether people cast her vote or not it is your duty to manage the result so they were very scared and afraid. Thank you very much, Tasmia. I know that you have to go. So thank you very much for being with us. It was fascinating. Thank you for talking to us about your PhD and I wish you all the best. And we also are hoping that you continue working with Indiana University as thank well you. as with Mesa. And thank you very much and all the best.
Thank you so much, Nega. Thank, Thank you. you, God. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a wonderful time. Take care. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.